So why do we do natives? It basically, I do it because I want to support uh, the pollinators and the birds. Uh, Carl and I started uh, the Virginia Bluebird Society 26 years ago with uh, three other people. And when I did that, I asked a friend of mine who was really into native plants, would she come and look at my yard and see what kind of natives I had? And she walked through the yard and she came back and she said, you have one. Now, that was 26 years ago when people were thinking about natives being pollinators and shrubs. Now we know that trees really are the real keystone, and that's due to Doug Tallamy talking about that. So I did have a lot of native trees there, and she wasn't even recognizing that. And honestly, I didn't recognize it till a year or so ago, where you've got that. So great native trees, an oak supports 534 species. Now that's across the spectrum. Um, a river birch, 413. Um, an elm, 213. And um, a pine, 203. But let me tell you what butterflies get supported there. And that's what's important. And you say, well, wait a minute, what about butterflies? They need pollen, but more importantly, they need the tree to lay their eggs on. And if we don't have caterpillars, we don't have butterflies. And we also forget about moths. Moths are really a big part of the caterpillar kingdom. So 532 butterflies and moths are supported by oaks. Willow oaks, 450, willows, 455. A birch supports 411. And a crepe myrtle supports three. Oh my. <laughs> a chickadee wow. feeds its young exclusively on caterpillars. They don't feed them anything else because that's the most nutritious thing that they can give their young. One nest of nestlings takes about six to 9,000 caterpillars. If you don't have oak trees in your yard or next door, you're not going to have chickadees. And chickadees are de declining. So I did a picture here. This is the, um, of the summer when we moved in. This is our backyard. And that was it. There was actually um, two trees. There was a uh, magnolia, and then there was that big uh, tree in the back. In the front yard, this is our yard. Hmm. And that's what we had to work with. We actually had two shrubs. We had the sweet shrub back there, and we had a forsythia, and I pulled it out immediately because I hate forsythia. So when I start looking at shrubs and butterflies, all of a sudden we're looking at arrowwood viburnum supports 104 species, a hydrangea supports five, a butterfly bush supports one, forsythia one, and a nandina zero. So you can see where trees have just got to be the foundation for, for all of this. So when we look at our yard, we've got 43 trees in our yard, small and big, and we've made it work because we started with lots of seedlings. So this was our yard in 2005, and I'm gonna point out to you, you're not gonna be able to see this very well. It takes me a second to find it. There it is. There's the river birch right there. Good grief. That's the river birch right there. Okay? Okay. You've seen my three? I'm in for a <laughs> Yeah. So why is that growing so well? First of all, it's in the right spot. It's getting a lot of water. You'll also notice at the base of it, it's got a flare, which is really critical for a tree. We want to not bury that base because then you're going to be getting uh, degradation on the, the trunk of the tree because there's little breathing holes there. So you need to keep the mulch and everything else. Um, honestly, we don't feed anything in this yard. We don't put any pesticides in this yard. I don't have even water. Last summer I watered twice. Because this is an ecosystem together, it's working together. Um, when we transition into a shade garden, this is what our shade garden is gonna look like this summer. And we'll have the garden open the last Saturday of May and, and June. So you can see what the difference is. Right now what we've got is a lot of ephemerals Ephemerals means they kind of disappear, right? So that area was covered with um, uh, bluebells earlier. Now I've got my wild violets and wild strawberries. And so somebody was just here telling me they pull their wild violets and wild strawberries. 
You don't need to. They're the perfect thing to keep weeds down. They feed the bees because it's the first thing that comes with flowers. And they feed the birds with those little wild strawberries. Hence, I've got them all over the yard because I've got hundreds and hundreds of birds all the time. So that's what you want to keep thinking about. In a yard like this, we started with your hard hardscape, which is your rock walls, your paths, your ponds, anything like that. And the next level is your trees, because your trees are your bones. But you also need to have evergreens for the trees, for the birds to hide. Because if the birds don't have a place to hide, they're not going to come here. So this is a non-native, but it stays this height. It gets very wide, and it is a great, great shrub for birds to hide in when they're feeding in the yard. What I've got, what is that? this is called a cherry laurel, oh, cherry and it's an autolucans that only gets about three feet high, but eight feet wide. Mm. It smells and, beautiful. And, and, and believe the tags. When the tag says it gets eight feet wide, they're not, they're not lying to you. <laughs> Put it where it can get eight feet tall. You don't really want to do all that much pruning. So we are going to actually get rid of these two Burford hollies back here because they're non-natives. They get a lot of aphids on them. I got to prune them all the time because they get eight feet tall and I don't want them. <coughs> so a perfect thing for there is going to be a native holly. And so that's what I'm going to be putting in there. Ilex glabra. It's got berries for the birds. It's evergreen. And it's going to get about six feet tall.